This is the Pedestrian Podcast. I don't know. That's just what pedestrian average mediocre receivers do. What's up? What's up? My man Deion Sanders, we all right, huh? We all right? Yeah, we all right. We're going to go to the Super Bowl again, being all right. The official podcast of the UK Seahawkers. Here are your hosts. Stuart Court. Le'Veon Bell wants to be paid as an offensive weapon, when, if you're the Steelers, he's come across as a bit of a weapon himself in different ways. <laughs> and Adam Nathan. Um, it's, tr- it's tricky because Hugh Jackson said nothing for me to shove him in. <laughs> we are going to follow you. Gotcha, you lead us, gotcha, okay? Gotcha. Like I told you before, you lead us to darkness, we will follow you. Go Hawks. Another week and another Seahawks loss to dissect and discuss. Welcome to another episode of the Pedestrian Podcast. Still the one only unofficial UK Seahawks podcast. As ever, myself, Stuart Court, is joined by Adam Nathan. How are we, sir? Not too bad, my friend. Uh, all is good in uh, in the big smoke. Uh, and um, hopefully the fact that we've got another game tomorrow being Thursday means we can banish the uh, the despair of uh, another Saturday Sunday night defeat. Yep, Sunday night the Seahawks made the trip down to Cal- Southern California to play at the Coliseum again against the Al A Rams and came up like they did a week before at home to the other team in Los Angeles, uh, the Chargers. They come up just short in somewhat annoying and frustrating circumstances, losing 36-31 to drop to four and five on the season and basically wrap up if there's any doubt about where the NFC West title banner was heading to this uh, season. But before we get into the nitty gritty of the game, uh, overall feelings on it, Adam? Um, well, there's a lot to be positive about, which is undeniable. Um, I think the defence are, you know, whenever you give up 33 points, you're thinking, oh, that's not not really great. But, you know, they gave up a touchdown off a fumble from the offense. They gave up three points to a ridiculous onside kick decision, which just was never really likely to work. So let's say that the defense gave up 23 points to the hottest attack in the NFL. Well, one of that, that's not bad going. No. And the offense, you know, we don't particularly like watching it. And I I don't think it's potentially sustainable, but I want to get into this later on um, for for a winning team in the future. But the offense are finding a way to put points on the board uh, and keeping these games close. Now you either look at it and say, Oh, you know, we're so unlucky to be four and five. And, you know, in another world we could be, we could be uh, six and three or seven and two. But I think probably where we are, as Mike Dugar said in his article on Monday, where we are kind of indicates what we are and that we're just not quite good enough to beat the good teams no. and we're better than the bad teams. Yeah, it's this kind of that purgatory which a lot of teams find themselves on year on year. We've kind of fallen into that uh, in 2018, which is was somewhat predictable, but then at the same time, it's somewhat a little bit better than we probably expected at the end of August, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you can certainly... We thought... You know, going into this season, they've balls that big time here because they've got not many draft picks for next year, and they've not got nothing. They've, sorry, they've received little in return for losing basically all of their defensive weapons, and, and you know, even, even Paul Richardson, Jimmy Graham. So going forward, it's going to be hard to build a roster. But you watch this team now, and if you were to draw up your, let's say, forty starting players that or 40 players that are going to contribute on offense and defense in the season you, you can tick off quite a few names now which is much more positive than i thought it was going to be uh you know a couple of months ago yeah i, I agree i think i mean i don't know about you but sunday was probably one of the, the end of the games as invested into in the game as i've been for a little while as well i'm not too sure why i think it's just because i wasn't at work anymore and i was actually at home watching it um but yeah it, it, it kind of it it was it was weird to kind of be attached to this team when I was kind of ex- accepted, accepting the fact at the start of the season that this is going to be a year just to kind of grin and bear. But I don't know. There's just some frustrating things we'll probably get into. Obviously, the main focal point, as ever, on the offensive side of the ball for was Russell Wilson. Um, obviously, he made was part of the, the the play which kind of ended the game when he gave up a uh, was a sack by Dante Fowler, which he fumbled and the Rams recovered and scored a play later. Uh, through Brandon Cox, but uh, entering the final six minutes of the game, Wilson only had 79 passing yards 
on 13 attempts and then he went for 197 on 13 attempts in the, the final six minutes. I mean, there's a lot and there's a lot of finger pointing going around. I think there's one person in particular for both of us who we're pointing a finger at, but he, he's the late game heroics are becoming too much of a commonplace and they're asking him to do too much when really if they spread what they're asking him to do in the final six minutes over the rest of the game, this Seahawks, this Seahawks team sits with a different record and it's a, a lot more enjoyable and less frustrating to watch, isn't it? Well, Jackson Bevan's had the tweet of the season for me so far when he said, in relation to those stats, why don't they build a whole plane of passing <laughs> attempts as a kind of uh, an homage to that? Why don't they build the whole plane out of the black box material is indestructible. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're, we're getting onto this quicker than I thought we were going to. Oh, sorry. Um, no, no, it's cool. So I've been thinking a lot about the offense today and I, I get what they're doing because they've basically built a system where they can keep games against good teams close and they can beat bad teams. And in a team that is generally bereft of our talent, I kind of get it. And I, I understand this is the way that it, it, it's sensible to play like this. My worry is going forward, they want to play like this as well when they have had, you know, a second draft, uh, a second big batch of free agency, which they can do this, this off season because they're going to have a lot of money to spend. And it worries me that that is when it becomes a waste, you know, it, the, the way the Seahawks are playing now, and we don't reference basketball an awful lot, and you know more about it than I do, I think, but it would be like a team turning around and saying, yeah, Golden State wins the championship, the championship with, you know, focusing on the three-point attempts, but we're just going to try and hit layups and two-point shots all night and see if it works. And I just wonder how how much they can fly in the face of what common wisdom is and try and win, because really they're the only team that's trying to play like this that thinks they can be good. And that's where I'm slightly worried going uh, forward. Um, yeah, it is a is a bit of a worry because it, it's 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 not just a passing phase. This is kind of setting stone of how the current of the coaches, obviously, Doc Tucker and Carroll, kind of want to do things for as long as the duo with Carroll and Shotgun are calling the plays and drawing up a defensive scheme, which is somewhat of a worry. But I, I don't think that the team would do it more than any other. I think the team we're facing this Thursday night are probably second to that where they just run the ball and the passing offence is an absolute abomination for most of the game until it's too late in games where they've trailed but yeah it's just it's yeah it's, it's I mean like I don't I, I, I'm, I'm okay with it now I, like I'm not loving watching it but it's obviously effective it obviously gets the best out of probably the offensive players we have but I just but but I don't know. I, I I can't sign up to the idea that this is the way to win when you watch how teams at the Saints, the Rams, and the Chiefs play, who are three of the best teams I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, on Sunday, I think there's been twice this season where the Saints uh, punter Morstead hasn't punted the ball. That's not because they run run pass. It's because they've got a court, a quarterback who some somehow, even at this late stage of his career, is probably having the career, the season of his life. And they've got a receiver who's at the top of his game. They've got two running, well, a running back in Alvin Kamara who's in, is barely missed a step from what it was. They, they've got an offensive identity, which even with the two running backs, it's not on the, those two running backs to, to carry load and be the focal point and be, if well, if these don't go, no, nothing else goes. But it's the case quite clearly for the Seahawks. Even with the 290,000 yards on the ground they got on Sunday, they still come up short because of when the, the time called for a pass play or to, to put the, the, the game or the drive into the, the hands of Russell Wilson, they, they, it was either the play call was lacking or the defence understood it, which is what you're going to get when you've got the defensive line that they were facing. On. So it just, it, 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 but this last week and against, against the Chargers was just showing how this team, while the Chargers was this game where they the, the team showed they were, they were a year early, just give that a year, but this game kind of shows like the chasm that is between the haves and the haves not to the offensive side of the ball. I just think there's no bigger victim of well, victim of circumstance in the NFL as Russell Wilson. I think I've, a lot of people point to Andrew Locke over his first five, well, six, seven years in the NFL, lack of offensive line. Look what he's doing now. They've sorted that uh, unit out with Hyde. They've invested in it, and they've got an, a, an offensive coach in the building, and that team looks. Like it could be a bit of a problem in the AFC for for as long as Frank Reich 
and Andrew Luck are in Indianapolis. If if that that organization can kind of flip the switch on that, it's just doubly frustrating that the Seahawks are so entrenched in this way. As you said, it, it, it's fun to watch Richard Payne over 100 yards. Mike Davis continue to be effective when he's called upon in, in the in the uh, run and passing game. But it's just not... It's, it's just so frustrating. Like you said about Shanahan and the Falcons a few years ago, it, when you watch other teams, it's like watching a different sport. Like you watch the Steelers and the Panthers where the game got out hand, of uh, hand pretty quickly. The way they go up and down the field is just completely alien to anyone in the Seahawks building, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I guess the best way I could sum it up is that every time there was an obvious passing yeah. play, that pretty much <clears throat> led to the sacks that the Rams had. We did a really good job of not being in that position yeah. too often, but every every time it was fairly obvious on like a third down we were going to have to pass, the Rams' defensive front just had their yeah. way with us. And there will always be a time in a game where you have to pass, like always, because at some point you're going to need to pick up you know more yards than you can rush for. But there's never necessarily going to be a time when you have to rush. You could feasibly dink and dunk and you know screen pass your whole way down. And I just worry that it's it's very one dimensional and very kind of formulaic now. And if we're in a position where you have to pass to win, we're not winning any no. of those games. And the way the NFL is going is a passing yeah. league. And, and so, so that's where I have real concerns about this going forward, albeit with the nod to the fact that it's not necessarily the stupidest way to play right now, given the talent or lack thereof <clears> there <throat> is. Yeah. yeah but, through the- but at the same time, the, 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 the players that they have got are paid to do a job which they're not, especially if you look at people like Doug Baldwin, who's been, well, who he said yesterday on the radio. No, no. He's, yeah, he's been completely forgotten almost. But he said yesterday, Monday or Tuesday was the first time he woke up in four months and didn't feel any pain, which is just, that just does not sound enjoyable at all. And it's just, they've invested in players who they're not putting in the best positions to make it worth that much kind of. Just, just counterproductive, isn't it, really? Yeah, and like the offensive line is getting better. Yeah. And as a run-blocking offensive line, they're great. But that's not really getting us anywhere, no. really. You know, that, that that's great if you want to run, and then that's great when you're in a one-score game or when you're in the lead. But ultimately, the likelihood it is you're going to be behind against these good teams, and what can you do then? And ultimately, that's where we came up short. And, and so that's where... Mm. That's where I'm concerned because every, nothing seems to be built with the way the modern NFL is going in mind. Yeah. Um, and look, every great team, you know, the, the 2013 Seahawks came out of uh, coaching innovation, tra- changing the game. And maybe this is Carroll changing the game back to where it is. But there's not a lot to suggest when you watch the other teams that that is actually the case. Like if you do your you know list of 100 best NFL players right now, there's not going to be a lot of defenders on there because teams just aren't really playing great defense anymore. Even the Packers last year, who were close to a generational defense, they still got smoked in two playoff games and had to score enough points to get them through. Like The game's changing, and I, I just wonder if we're <clears throat> belligerently not changing no. with it. Well, I think well, we heard a lot of groans with Darrell Beverly as, as, as was the offensive coordinator that the, the, the team Russell Wilson the offense only went when they did no huddle but and a couple of years ago we heard Pete Carroll say that Wilson and Earl Thomas on the defensive side were going to be brought in and kind of opened up opened up to more information and given more given the reins more almost that doesn't seem to have happened as, as particularly this year I mean in 2017 if it wasn't for Russell Wilson this team is picking in the top 10 in the 2018 draft. He got every, everything the Seahawks offense did last year was through and because of Russell Wilson, but it just seems to kind of gone away from that. I mean, the evidence was there all off-season that Wilson was ready and willing and able to to, to take even more on. They just kind of completely shied away from that, backed away from that, just out of, I don't know, stubbornness or, I don't know. It's just he's so, so frustrating. Well, and even in this game... In Los Angeles, where the running game comes out, you know, looking absolutely great, we scored four touchdowns and three of them were all because of Russell yeah. Wilson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. The only one that wasn't is because 
was hatched down to... And he broke off two big yeah, runs. Well, OK, but Mike, uh, Mike Davis one was a pretty cool pickle at that time, which Tony Romo pointed on. That's the other thing. Tony Romo, if, if you have a commentator on TV covering your game, say after two and a half hours of watching your team, probably for the first time this season, OK, I've seen enough rushes now. You've, you've, you're probably doing something a bit wrong because it's not like that. He said in the, the final three, when he's, uh, well, no, after the fumble, then the Cooks TD. He said, "Okay, I've, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen enough of you winning the ball. Now for it." And they didn't. <laughs> they just carried on doing what they're going to do. But it's just, yeah, it's, it's as long as I think, it's, I think, I think it's just it's, it's the case of accepting this is what it's going to be like, and it's just the case of how. Many games Wilson can keep us in, or the defense can keep us in. Which, yeah, they probably didn't. They probably let the side down a little bit on Sunday, apart from one or two. Um, but it's just if the change does come and the, the the switch is flipped from the coaching or from the coaching staff and the scheme and everything, it's just a case of how far behind everyone else the team are going to be, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think they are going to make no. any changes to the coaching no. staff. I think this is what yeah. we've got, and you're kind of yeah. stuck with it. And I, I actually think it's going to be a lot more frustrating next year than it is this yeah. year. Uh, so, yeah, after Sunday, obviously, the Rams scored over 30 again. But after that, Russell Wilson is now 3-26 and in his career in games where the Seahawks have given up, where his defense have given up 25 or more points. That's just another result of Pete's way of doing things obviously it's I mean three and 26 that's a wild stat for a quarterback who appears to have done nothing but win since he well the sad thing is that you know you score on your first two drives and then you don't really go again into the middle of the third quarter we just kind of wasted uh well let's say middle of the f- back end of the oh. first quarter to middle of the third quarter just wasted about 20 minutes of the game on offense just playing overly conservative and you know I, you kind of wonder if we kept our pedal to the metal and gone all out for the whole game, you know, the, the sky could have been the limit. Yeah, um, the, the, the biggest bugbear for me on Sunday was that two-minute drill, or that glare off at the end of the first half, because they just seemed like they did, and like I think they admitted after the Chargers game, they, they were petrified of a mistake, but they just kind of just ran the most vanilla plays that went for three, four yards, and when it come to pass, and it was third and 22 or whatever it was, it, just, it was the most frustrating thing, and if it wasn't for just the most ridiculous punt again by Mike Dixon. And the Rams probably have a chance to at least get into field goal range, but the fact that Dixon managed to pin it down at like the five-inch line, there's the only reason that the, the Rams just kind of t- just walked off after a kneel down because the, the way the Seahawks called that two-minute uh, uh, offensive drive was well was just that it was offensive. It was it was just so frustrating because against the team we say okay the Rams are, like they have virtually every game this season they're going to score over 30 and it was an opportunity to kind of just get a body blow in and they just had no intention of doing that from the minute they've got the ball with I think it was like 2 minutes 50 2 minutes 55 to play in the second in the second, in the second quarter and it's, it's just I mean I think by Ben Baldwin break it down I think it's four runs and then a bit of a rush scramble then an incomplete pass to Tyler Lockett or more, I think, and then obviously the ridiculous. But it was just that kind of encapsulated everything, which is wrong. They just this it's almost like a paranoia. Just I don't know, just it's just so naive from coaches who have done it for a long, long time. It just just they just seems scared of going for it when the quarterback, as I said last year, showed that he was able and he's been invested in the last couple of years enough to put that trust in there when they just don't, it doesn't seem to exist it's just oh, I hated it the, the way the way they play is that they kind of they're never willing to get themselves out of a hole unless it, the game's literally on the line so like they have one negative play on a drive and they yeah. drop on the drive yeah it's like, like whereas was, was, you know, was, the, the Rivers thing the Rivers thing last week will be the clearest example of you know 3 and 15 the Chargers aren't worried they throw a 55 yard bomb and then throw then run for a 39 yard touchdown Whereas we, you know, get to third and long, and it's like, well, no, we can't can't do anything. I'll just give this one up. We'll play defense yeah, well, again. The, the Rams did it at least twice on Sunday. They had the one where it's a long gain. The only play, I think, Jared Everett or Higby in the middle of the field, surrounded by no one. I mean, the, I mean and they had one to Brandon yeah, Cooks, yeah, one yeah, third yeah, and fifteen. Yeah, I think, yeah, I knew there was the second one. Yeah, it's just uh, uh, like the, as Tony Romo kept pointing out as well on Sunday, the Rams. 
just run the same and the Niners as well. Uh, with the Shanahan do the same. They just run the same three or four plays. They don't do anything exotic. They just do it well, don't they? Because like they, they was literally the yeah. same four looks. I think Romo pointed out this. Like they've like they've, they're going to do the the counter to Gurley, but then they're going to play action in two plays time. They just did that again and again and again. But the, the Seahawks don't seem willing to just play action. It's a whole other matter. They just don't seem willing to do that. Well, yeah, the Rams line up, I think, 94% of the time in 11 yeah. formation. So you got, that means one, one running back, one tight end, and three receivers. And it's always the same three receivers. So ultimately, you're pretty much doing the same thing on every play, and yet every play yeah. works. Whereas, you know, we're, we're messing things around and changing people in and changing setups and whatever. And it's just, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it seems completely, I, th- so I think Greg Bell made a great point where he said, one team runs the same formation 94% of the time, and the other team is predictable on offense. That's a great line. Which is a really yeah, good yeah. line. I mean, they, they, they ran like a, a fullback slam with Robert Woods on Sunday, the Rams did. Like, the, the, like the, I think it was a pull in right guard, and Goff handed the ball off to Robert Woods. It was just. It was, oh, yeah. I, oh, oh, one, day, one, one day we'll get to watch an <laughs> offense like that. McVeigh is a. Um, a very, very, very annoyingly good um, coach. Uh, obviously, we're talking about the running game, Rashad Penny had, uh, much to the chagrin to someone on Twitter, obviously, um, had uh, a breakout game, 12 attempts, 108 yards, and a really impressive uh, touchdown run. Uh, he, I think I, was, I, I think I texted you Sunday or Monday saying the biggest thing for Rashad Penny is that he was clearly told early in the week he was going to be given the ball, he was going to be the guy on Sunday, and his confidence shone. And he's, he, he just seems more assured and more assertive when the ball was in his hands, didn't he, on Sunday? Yeah, I mean, sport is obviously incredibly uh, driven by the, the mental fortitude of, of players. And he just looked like a guy who didn't have to look over his shoulder the whole time and see, you know, when his number was going to be up to be subst- out, substituted out after one run. He knew he was going to get, you know, whole drives to play. And I, I don't think it's any coincidence at all that he looked quicker um, speedier, he, you know, he hit the holes better. He, you know, his his cuts were really great. He he looked almost 15 pounds lighter the way he was running, and it's almost like that 15 pounds was was a mental weight put on him by not knowing how long he was going to be on the field for. Yeah, the, the the only thing which is missing from his day on Sunday was he didn't get a single target or target or catch in the passing game, which is I think is how we've used him really for for the first eight games. It would have been fun to see how they used him in that um, way. On Sunday, but yeah, I just, I just, he, he kind of looked like the, a player who has kind of got his legs underneath him. As I said, the confidence was so clear to see, and he looks like someone who could be fun to watch. But it was all outside. Just, just I mean, there is a case where Penny Davis, well, any two Davis or Carson along with Penny could be a pretty effective one-two punch before we started, and we'll get into in a bit. Uh, next week about the Panthers, how they kind of do it with McCaffrey and the, the, the bigger back last year with Jonathan Stewart. That kind of like thunder and lightning kind of thing could be quite effective because Carson seems a lot more effective downhill and Penny, than Penny seems on the outside, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, ironically, someone was saying, I think Roma was saying, you know, if you if you run straight at, you know, Donald and Sue, you can kind of negate them a bit. But I actually thought the majority of our good runs came and we were you know running outside the tackles or uh you know running out wide and i I did wonder why we had such a lack of a screen game because i i really thought that could have been quite effective especially on those plays where you know we were going to have to pass um i can't think of any any time we we called like a a toss pass to a a, to a running back or or i mean the only and i I wonder why just i mean yeah i mean the only non-traditional running play was just the 18 yard End around when they lock it. I mean, that's the only one I can think of. Yeah, I mean, right. It's just humdrum. As ever, Mike Davis, though, 11 for 58. Uh, and then he got six, uh, four catches for 22. And the late fourth quarter touchdown, which was a pretty cool play call from Shot and I might giving him a little bit of credit. Um, but he's, he's, he is, no matter who the lead guys were, obviously 12, 12 rushes to 11, he may have been. He obviously got more time on the field than Penny did on Sunday which is another case for um, 
uh, frustration with the with uh, on the offensive side of the ball. But he's 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 effective at what he does and a pretty solid, if not flashy player, isn't he, Mike Davis? Yeah, he's um, probably the archetypal. It's not even a I don't know. Not many teams have three running backs, really, no. do they? I mean, Penny, and none of them really, you would say, are third down backs at this stage. So I don't, I guess they're all good at filling in what they, what, you know, if one of them needs a rest or whatever, they can kind of do each other's jobs. Um, and when McKissick comes back, it'll be interesting to see who he takes carries and snaps from. I would imagine it will be Mike yeah. Davis, um, who just will end up being kind of the odd man out. But, He's he's certainly been a useful, yeah. For, he, he, for me, he's kind of the sixty-five yard guy. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what yeah. he could give you every yeah, week. Very, very unspectacular. But well, eleven fifty-eight is pretty effective on what was a ridiculously effective day on the ground for the Seahawks offense. Outside of him, Tyler Lockett got yet another touchdown. Nick Vanette again continues to emerge in the absence uh, of Will Disley, but also with the. Um, with the I can't think of the word. Uh, with the fact that Ed Dixon is now on the field, he, he, he seems to be making the most of what are primitive opportunities in the past game. Only got two targets, one catch for eight yards, and another pretty impressive touchdown grab, wasn't it? Yeah, it was another great catch. I mean, this one was a crazily good throw again between two guys. Um, Wilson obviously really likes that one. The one against uh, the Chargers was fairly similar as well. Um, but good, good on Vanette. He was a he was a guy that last year I didn't see as someone that was going to have a big future. He just didn't look like he had, I don't know, anything particularly special about him. Who do we compare him to? Um, we've forgotten the guy's uh, name Doug again. Carson. No, 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 no. Uh, he played more Cooper recently Alfred. than that. Yeah, Cooper Helfit. We thought it was just Cooper Helfit the second, but he's actually developed into you know a pretty good and reliable player for Wilson. Albeit he's only getting two targets or two catches because we're just not throwing it enough to to make it make it that useful. But you, know, you look at someone like George Kittle at San, at San Francisco who's having a great time of it. If you watch the catches the two of them make, it's not wildly no. dissimilar to what the, the stuff that Vanette's doing. No, yeah, but he's just athlet, got athleticism coming out of his eyeballs as uh, George Kittle in San Francisco. Yeah, but uh, uh, Vanette as well. I mean, obviously, it's not something we don't watch the film, obviously, Adam, because, yeah, we don't, we don't go out and film. <laughs> um, but he's he's also, apparently, from people, Sam Gold and uh, other guys who watch film, he's doing a pretty good job in the in the run game as well, being a pass, pass blocker, which is a massive part of his game, which was lauded when he came out of Ohio State a couple of years ago as well. So it's it, it kind of coming round in that third year, which we kind of saw a more explosive wave from Golden Tate back in the day. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly helpful. And um, it, it, it's nice that we can bring a tight end in and it doesn't immediately look like we're going to run because uh, at the minute that's kind of, well, you either bring George Fat in and call him eligible and you kind of know what play is coming or, uh, or you bring in, yeah, but it, it's good if you can have a net on the end of the line and it doesn't kind of tilt exactly to what, what's going to be. So the, the more skills he can add to his game. Uh, and again, we're in a position now where it looks like the tight end position next year is fairly well set with this leap and Vanette. You know, it's not a play, a position you're going to, uh, Dixon's only on a, on a one year or is he on a, a longer term deal? Right? Oh, fine. So, you know, that position is not a position that's going to need any investment in whatsoever. So that, that's quite nice coming into, you know, going into next season saying, yep, that's cool. Move on to the next position yeah, to look at. It's good, but it's a really good tight end class as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but switch uh, offensive line. Obviously, you know, DJ Fluker, Dwayne Brown uh, took all of the blame for the late, uh, well, he gave up the sack from Dante Fowler. But the airline line again on the run, the, apart from when Aaron Donald just made shapes and moves which a player of his size and stature should not be able to make again was effective enough especially on that way to the, all the yards they got on the ground but the fact that Jordan Simmons who's making his first out for about 15 years um, it, 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 he didn't start in know, college he was injured a lot of college and then he was um, undrafted he's a USC guy so there's obviously some pretty there's had to be some intel on him from people Pete knows down there so uh, pretty cool that he made his debut on his college uh, his college stadium as well but there was no glaring drop off apart from those ridiculous plays from the Rams number 99 must though 
Yeah, but even that, you'd imagine Donald would have got his if Fuqua yeah, was there. I mean, just, just the, 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 big, the biggest problem I had with all of it was that they went into that third and three play in empty. Yeah. And they just made it very obvious what they were going to do. And you can talk to me about protections and it gave Wilson easy completions. Why would you take away the risk of basically two of the three things that you're good at, which is A, running, and B, Wilson rushed for 92 <laughs> yards. You know, if you've got a running back there, the zone read becomes a huge option. And ironically, the um, voluminous group on social media who advocate never running, the one position they do advocate running in is when you need to pick up short yardage, that's actually more effective a position to run in than it is yeah. pass. So it seems such a strange decision to go into into empty uh, at that at that position and you know make it very obvious that a pass play was coming. Um, that I did find that frustrating, and, and I thought the offensive line were and Russell uh, actually were hung out to dry by the coach's decisions. Yeah, on and also, that. also another thing which the Rams are so effective at, and as we spoke on Twitter to. I think Ben Bowl with a Mike Dugar over the weekend about first down, a first down play for the Seahawks, bringing another first down play, the play after, does not happen. It's the lowest rate apart from the Bills and the Cardinals and what they're doing on offense. Well, I think I think the Cardinals jumped above oh, us on Sunday, having looked at the stats brilliant. again. Person. So just the Bills who <laughs> had Matt Barkley on his 17th team start from on Sunday against just the hapless New York Jets. But if, I mean, don't hold me to this, but I'm pretty certain the, the big touchdown drives that the the Rams had on Sunday, the first couple of plays were first down runs. I mean, I think Todd Gillett point had 11 yards per carry or per touch average. I mean, that's just ridiculous. That's the first down every time a running back touches the ball. Obviously, schemed open and all that, but it's, it, it works and it's just something which they don't... They seem happy in second and six and second and five, and then if that doesn't work, then it's just, as you say, just weird play calls when it should be the, the play you just use on second down. should be the play on third, though, it's just all very weird and foreign and frustrating on the offensive side of the ball. None more so on first down when you watch Todd Gilly and Jared Goff. It's almost like, it's almost like sorry to interrupt, that they don't want to complete first downs early because you can't run the clock out that way and you you, you know, leave more time on the clock. And it just it's just a negative way of thinking, you know, like second and third down, if you run it every time, you can take probably a minute and a half off clock every set of three downs. And then if you have four of those, you'll have seven and a half minute touchdown drives. It seems that the team would rather have a seven and a half minute touchdown drive than a one and a half minute drive. Yeah, it's, it's, what, I think it's like 21% of first down plays. And, and I think they got two in the fourth quarter. And it was when they put the ball literally in the hands of Russell Wilson, he scrambled for two. So it, it, it goes yeah. back again. If you put the ball in the, the best defensive player that the Seahawks have, it's good and it brings positive things and happiness, joy and rainbows and everything to the Seahawks offence. So when you don't and when you kind of stick to what is an archaic formula, it's frustrating and doesn't work and doesn't benefit anyone apart from the fact that you hit that 53 play nonsense. But yeah, <laughs> On the defensive side though, it wasn't great from the defence there. KJ Wright uh, missed, I think was it all or most of the second half with a recurrence of that knee injury which does not bode well for his NFL or particularly Seahawks future past uh, the end of this season. But Bobby Wagner, Bobby, Bobby Wagner, he is in a different universe to not only everyone on this Seahawks defense, but every other player who plays position, isn't he? I mean, Luke Kuechly is having a decent season, but Bobby, every big play, every third down stop, Bobby Wagner was there. He ended the game with 13 tackles, 10 of them solo, and one quarterback hit. I mean, I know it's in a defense that gives up all the points and three hundred, like five hundred, nearly five hundred yards. There can't be many better defensive performances than what Bobby Wagner put on the film on Sunday, can there? No, it's interesting because I was thinking, you know, we often do our one's praise and whatever, and I was thinking, well, there's no <laughs> one on defense you can you can really praise because no one really jumped out. And then I remembered some of those plays that. Bobby made, he, he was just on a different planet <laughs> to the rest of the guys out there. I mean, there was, I think there was quite a few plays in the second half where he was the only linebacker on the field because of KJ's injury and the lack of trust he'd probably have in Nessus Calitro, Griffin, and maybe, uh, who else got linebacker? Uh, Maurice Alexander and Mingo. I don't Bingo. see him even with 
a, oh, one tackle he had on Sunday by Kivius Mingo. Um, but yeah, so yeah, he's just yeah, it's it's quite incredible that that is. If anyone has any doubt, you just need to put that film on. Obviously, one that we haven't watched, Adam. Um, yeah, oh, uh, elsewhere, uh, Shaquille Griffin is. I mean, he started off the season like a house on fan. He really began to look like someone who used to play that position for the Seahawks, but he kind of looked a bit leggy and. Uh, seemed to have a few ills on Sunday. I mean, there's a play when I think Cooks or Cup cut inside him. And he, he looked like to be limping. He's, I mean, Trey Flowers is having a. He's he's slowly becoming the player where you just don't see mentioned or see any balls go towards him. And Sunday seemed to be that again, where Griffin seems to be seems to have a weakness currently that opponent teams are picking on. Or is that overly harsh? I have to say I didn't notice that. Um, that's not to say that you're wrong, but I, I just didn't notice that particularly. The one thing that I noticed with the Rams, and I've been thinking about for the last couple of days, is I cannot think of one contested catch no. they had to make. No. You know, every 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 play, someone has just schemed like a city <laughs> wide open. Yeah, yeah. And I, I find it tricky it based on that. Not to say that he you know, had a good game back. Otherwise, I just kind of wonder if that's just only yeah. out coach and whether or, whether or not the players are doing the right thing or not. Yeah, you know, they just had our number for the second yeah, of the season. It's quite an operation on that offensive side of the ball. Uh, elsewhere, there, Jaron Reed has a few had one big time play uh, stopping the two point conversion, which could have come uh, to bite the Rams. It obviously it didn't at the end of the game. But yeah, it it, it has to be better going forward. And it was a rare occasion where for all the ills on the offensive side, the defence suffered, well, 10 of the players on defence suffered on Sunday, didn't they? Yeah, very much so. It was uh, it was a day they probably wouldn't want to revisit too, too quickly. But I don't even know how you analyse no. the tape after a game like that, because, you know, every single play, there's just, you know, 17 <laughs> guys that are wide open against you. And it's, it's just, it's, it's like sorcery. <laughs> it was really, really... Annoying. Um, yeah, moving on. The Seahawks obviously do now stand at four and five. They play uh, well later today. If you're hearing this, because I think this will be going up on Thursday. So later today, Thursday night football against the Green Bay Packers. So now we're going to talk about Lynch that. In the backfield in a pistol formation. Wide receivers to either side. Russell takes the snap, drops back. He's going to throw down the middle. He's got a man. The ball is caught. Game over. It is a touchdown. The game is over. The Seahawks are going back to the Super Bowl in Glendale. What a catch in the end zone. It is curse. 35 yards. A long day for Jermaine. And he makes the game-winning reception in the end zone. They are going nuts at Century League. Yeah, the Seahawks are back at Century League Field on first the one and only Thursday night game of the 2018 season for the Seahawks. Uh, one of, and, and obviously another primetime game for this team, which is almost, by the end of the season, could be somewhat of a, a curse rather than a blessing. The Packers roll into town with a similar record to the Seahawks at 4-4-1. Four, four and one. Uh, They are third in the NFC North, and this is a team, as I said earlier, which kind of are leaning on their running back despite their all-world guy at quarterback, Adam. Yeah, Rogers' stats, like if you look, look at the analytics guys, he's kind of having a worse season than one like Andy Dalton, which would seem completely bizarre. Um, that doesn't mean to say that he couldn't absolutely torch us on Thursday, which is, uh, you know, a pot- very potentially could happen. Um, but I think this is a game where we, we should go in positive and, and uh, yeah, expect to win. Yeah, I think the, the, the Packers' offense is... I, 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 it's, it's weirdly similar. You can talk about Packers offense the same way we talk about the Seahawks offense, where it's run game heavy this year. The passing plays are kind of weird and don't make any a bit nonsensical. And the only reason they're in games and winning games is because of their quarterback. I mean, that sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? That seems to be the read on the Packers, and it kind of seems to be obviously how we see our lot this year, Adam. Yeah, it's a very good point. I didn't consider it that way. I like yeah. that a lot. Uh, so the Packers offense don't say all that. They are the number six ranked passing offense after saying all that. That's all on number 12. Getting to number 12 is all, uh, six years ago, that infamous Monday night of the fail Mary, or as I see it, the great contested catch 
from Golden Tate. Um, where they got to him early in that first half, and when they got to him late in the championship game, the last time they were in Seattle, it kind of puts Aaron Rodgers off a bit, and that's the most effective way of stopping him working his magic uh, on Thursday night, isn't it? Yeah, I think more than anyone, Rogers really relies on having a good relationship with his receivers. Um, if you look at Jordy Nelson's stats from last year when he was with or without Rogers, and that's probably the indicator of that. And doesn't quite seem to be on the page with anyone apart. I mean, even Devontae Adams last week, he got very pissed off with on the field yeah. for a miscommunication. He thought it was a back shoulder and it ended up, you know, I think uh, Adams ran a go route or something. So I, I think that the, the, the worry will always be that Rogers just has one of those days where he gets outside and he, he ends up playing, you know, basically playground football. But if we can keep him in the pocket, which is easier said than done, and make him just throw orthodox plays, I mean, it's kind of like what we'll probably say about the Seahawks, really, yeah. isn't it? Um, that he, they might struggle. I don't think he's kind of back at the level where he had Nelson on one side, Randall Cobb on the slot, and Devontae Adams as kind of a the other guy just just ripping up. So I, I think that's probably what we have to hope yeah, for. Yeah, and also Aaron Rodgers obviously on the short week and the travel day. I think they're already in Seattle. I think they practice in Seattle today. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is on the injury report with a knee injury. Obviously, he left the week one game uh, as the Bears before coming back in the second half and doing what Rodgers does in the comeback. This, the, the, the Packers though, do have some pretty notable injuries. Linebacker Nick Perry, cornerback Kevin King, which is a bit... Uh, a bit sad. Uh, safety Kentrell Bruce and wide receiver Randall Cobb have all been ruled out. Uh, Dave Bakht- David Bakhtiari, who's probably top three left tackles in the NFL this year, and Brian Bullard on the opposite side are both questionable entering the game. And Bradshaw Breland and the impressive rookie Jai Alexander are also questionable. Alexander has a concussion, so it seems unlikely he's going to be able to be cleared in time for the game on Thursday night. So there is banged up uh, important positions, and it's a defence which despite the change of coaches on that side of the ball, have given up a lot of yards to pretty meh teams this year, Adam. Yeah, I think they were probably a team in even more than just a defensive uh, change. Yeah. I think, really, Mike McCarthy should have had his had his last season last year. I think they're, they're paying the price for that a bit this year, where they almost seem to be kind of waiting for the off-season to get rid of him. And that's, that's never a great situation for a team yeah. to be in. That said, I still have them as probably one of my top ten or top 11 teams in the NFL. Um, and I think, you know, when all said and done on, on a neutral field, I'd probably expect to lose to them. But on Thursday night, short week, us home, them on the road, I kind of think we've got to consider ourselves as strong favourites here, especially with the number of injuries they've got. Yeah, I've just noticed something about their road games this year, which I'm not going to mention, um, just because I know you're very... Uh, into jinxes and things like that, so I'm going to move on. Um, yeah, I, but I, I do think if if the Seahawks have a game like they did on Sunday, the, the Packers' offensive scheme is as blighted with coaching deficiencies as the Seahawks one is. So I do I do think if they if they do this if they were as effective on the on the ground as Sunday or Thursday, I do think it would be a lot more enjoyable than the last Thursday night uh, the Seahawks had. Adam. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so on on the defensive uh, on the offensive side for the Seahawks, who do you expect or want to see more from uh, on on what is as we keep saying a pretty sure week? Um, I think you know Frank's going to need to have a big game. Uh, we we need sacks. You know you can't you can't really win without getting pressure and, and getting sacks. So Frank's going to be big. Um, and let's go with one guy you, you brought up, uh, Shaq Griffin, yeah. to uh, yeah, just to, to have a bounce back and uh, yeah, and, and have a, a big breakout game for the year that he's probably not had just no, yet. I, I, I literally, I really don't think that people are talking enough about what Trey Flowers doing on the opposite side or what the coaching has done with him because he, I, I, I don't remember a play which was alarming over the last couple of weeks that was clearly on him. I think there's a couple of plays on Sunday where we saw Tedrick Thompson. A slip over um, one play in particular where Pete Carroll just completely decimated them through Justin Coleman and the bus for uh, what was he said a fundamental breakdown from him, which is quite uh, quite um, sharp from Pete Carroll to say about one of his defen- defensive players. So, but there doesn't seem to be that f- from Trey Flowers, which is somewhat remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, he's become reliable. Just, well. 
yeah, I mean, what what's the best you could have hoped for going into the season with uh, a converted safety as a rookie playing cornerback opposite a second year? He's, I would say, well surpassed that already. Well surpassed yeah, it. Yeah, quite uh, comfortably as well. Obviously, it's a big game. Aaron Jones is going to get the, the ball a hell of a lot. Uh, from the Packers and so Jared Reed um, and all the other guys inside are going to have to stay in their lanes a little bit better and they have the last two weeks given up all the yards to Marvin Gordon and um, Todd Gurley but Aaron Jones all due respect isn't those two at running back is he? No he he you know hasn't got he might might be you have the talent but he hasn't got the credit in the bank to suggest he's anything like those players I mean in terms of the yardage on the ground Gurley didn't have that destructive a day. No, did he it? just got his usual 120 and a touchdown. <laughs> so he, he, how many of those yards were screen yards and, and passing yards? Well, that's that's rushing yards he got. He got 120. Fuck. He had 120 yards yeah. rushing. Jeez, <laughs> yeah. One sec. Yeah, yeah. No, he did. 120 yards rushing on 12 attempts. <laughs> I think. I think. I think yeah. The scheme of Andrew Whitworth is just. Could not be moving that well for the AG years. Uh, so are you confident uh, at this game? Obviously, it's a big... It's probably last chance to loom for the next couple of months for Seahawks every week for their slim uh, playoff hopes. Um, but the, this is, Russell Wilson, has, for as bad as he is when his defence gives up a lot of points, Russell Wilson is 26-7 and seven, uh, in the game f- the week after a loss, and it's a good time for him to get number 27 on a short week, isn't it? Yeah, and I think we are going to win, and I think it's going to be big, 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 big for the tiebreaker um, because it's, I, I think if you beat the, the Vikings and the Packers, you've got every chance of making the playoffs just on, on the basis of, of having the tiebreak. The worry is going to be that those two got a tie with each other, and it wouldn't be impossible to think that all three of us could have nine wins, and those two bastard teams will get it on the on the back of that stupid yeah, tie, which uh, yeah, yeah, which could be interesting. It could be something we have to revisit at the end of the season if that does come down, because that could kind of be a service. Like, like this team is kind of what it is, what it is at the minute. Um, so score prediction, Adam. Score prediction. What did I have? I had twenty nine twenty five to Seattle, but I don't think even that's a score that's remotely possible <laughs> to happen. I, I I I don't even know how you get. Um, but let's stick with it just for the fun of it. 29-25. Um, what do I have? I have... I mean, two chances by field goals, but that's not really a great way to, to rank no, the points. Up, not with uh, Jalikowski's onside kick exploits. Um, yeah, I've gone 33-23 on our pick so I think I'm going to stick with that. I do think the Seahawks are going to have a lot of joy on the ground, and I think Russell Wilson is going to find a ball win for a couple of touchdowns on Thursday night. That's what I hope for, because it's going to be 5 o'clock, and I can't, I can't take it like a 10-7 or anything like that. I mean, I mean, even the even the Niners and Giants had a pretty good game on Monday night. If they can do it, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, no Thursday night is just a general abomination. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, let's hope it's just half an abomination. So fifty-two twenty-one was the score uh, last week. Uh, the Steelers absolutely well just ran ahead. It was a tortoise in the hair, but the tortoise never caught up in, uh, from Carolina. Um, this this that's. It's going to be under that, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's going to be under that. Yeah, okay. If the over under is if the over under is set, at, uh, whatever that is, six <laughs> points, take the under. Yeah, and run. Uh, so yeah, uh, moving on. No, obviously Seahawks is a big old game for playoff credentials. So hopefully we'll be talking next week. Moving into uh, the Carolina Panthers week, still talking of playoff potential and playoff chances, no matter how slim they may. Be. Uh, moving on, now it's time, for, as ever, for this week's Get In The Bin, and our friend is back. First of all, this is an exciting time uh, for our organization. 2017 Browns joined the 2008 Lions as the only teams to go 0-16. Get In The Bin. Give me Josh Freeman, who was the 17th pick in the first round, over Cam Newton, who was the number one overall pick. And the 2015 AP Most Valuable Player is... Cam Newton. Get in the bin. Chip Kelly's an evolver, and he's a smart guy, and I think he's going to go to San Francisco and, and Mike, and they're going to be a much more viable football franchise. That the 49ers are expected to clean house and dismiss head coach Chip Kelly. Get in the bin. Yeah, this week's Get in the Bin, and it's, it, it, was, it was a long two weeks, Adam. But as I said, our old buddy is back. 
But he, he, he probably shouldn't be the one going in the bin this week, so I'm going to leave the floor to you for this. Well, the Bengals should be in the bin for rehiring Hugh Jackson as basically their assistant head coach, which is laughable in itself. But actually, the entire NFL can get in the bin with this nonsense. It is, you know, in, in English football, let's be you know, the proper football man. It's always joked about the same guys getting the same jobs. But it really is incredible that it's nothing to do, really, with what you know in the NFL. It's all about who you know. You know, I think one of the Seahawks wide receivers coaches is P- Pete Carroll's son. Yeah. Now, would he have that job if he wasn't Pete Carroll's son? Jeff Fisher's son in All, all or Nothing was famously one of the coaches, kind of just because he was Jeff Fisher's son. <laughs> And it's just insane that, like, these guys just keep getting these jobs and jobs and jobs. If Hugh Jackson hadn't shown exactly what he is in the last two and a half years in Cleveland and you still think he's fit to be hired, I, I, that you can't find anyone better than him, I just I just don't know what to tell you. And Cincinnati, you are just – you're the Everton of teams because <laughs> you're, you're just – you do nothing of interest to anyone and think you're important. You, but you, you, you really – you just do nothing – uh, to excite anyone ever, you you are Everton, um, <laughs> and and this is why Everton stay like Everton because they do stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. I think the fact that Marvin Lewis, I mean, what a week! It, like two weeks ago, they were uh, like a a wild like coming come up on the rails in the AFC, kind of surprising a few. Andy Dalton was fine, AJ Green regularity. The winning game was. Uh, flourishing with Joe Mixon and Gio Bernard was back healthy. They've got Tyler Boyd looking like just well, what, he sh- what he what he was for Pittsburgh in, in college. And he kind of like, okay, this, the Bengals are kind of, this is the year the Bengals are going to get off that playoff hump. They get, then they get absolutely waylaid against the Chiefs on, uh, on prime time. And then they give up 52 to what is a pretty, it's a pretty good offense the Orleans have, but they didn't, they didn't stop them. They did, as I say, the Saints again for the second time this season didn't punt the ball on Sunday. They scored on every drive they had. They didn't even have a kneel down in this game. They scored 52 points. And Marvin, Marvin, whatever his name is, Marvin Lewis, whatever his name is, uh, yeah, Marvin Lewis, uh, he's definitely, he was on the hot, he, sh- he, he should have been fired y- last year. He almost was fired last year. So he's clearly on a rather hot seat. And the, the way you react to giving up 52 at home, is by firing the defensive coordinator and hiring a coach who didn't win a game and was kind of just thought Baker Mayfield was a lesser option to Tyra Taylor. And Baker Mayfield as, uh, was dangerous, feeling dangerous on Sunday for the Browns as they beat the Falcons. It's just, yeah. it's The coordinator fire is my favourite thing in the NFL. But, 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 it, but, it, it's literally just... We want to get rid of the head coach, but it's going to cost us too much money, so we're going to throw someone under the bus. I think the only time it's ever worked that I can think of is that Jim Bob Cooter in Detroit yeah. has actually been a much better offensive coordinator, yeah, yeah. and that was worthy, worthy of a change. But it's such bullshit, the way it's like, yeah. we're awful. We're going to fire a coordinator. Yeah. Four, 14 months ago, I have a guess who fired the offensive coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> After three games, they fired the offensive coordinator because... The pressure was mounting on Marvin Lewis. They've done exactly the same, and then bought in a. As I think was it Rich Eisen put on Twitter. It's pretty smart from the Bengals because they they got the Browns to, to got to play the Browns twice, and as Hugh Jackson's shown, he he he's the only man who can stop that offense from doing anything. So it kind of it it, it just makes no sense. Yeah, as, as a very well deserved. I was I was quite happy to see that he is back because I'm sure there's going to be a lot coming from that. Uh, not just probably not this week, but over the off season, that's going to be something to watch because it seems like, I mean, it's not wild to suggest that that's a succession plan in place in, in Cincinnati, is it? Oh my God. I hadn't even thought about that. <laughs> it that's, can't be. that's literally the first thing I thought of. That it's a succession oh plan. Oh my God. <laughs> let's hope let's hope um, yeah so my get in the bin is um, I'm going to go down to the college ranks, ranks. Uh, Oklahoma State Cowboys head coach Mike Gundy can get in the bin this week he called players snowflakes the generation Z or X whatever they're called they're snowflakes they're entitled and they don't have what it takes to fight for a job or f- fight for their way through he's talking about teenage kids who are unpaid and w- work their tails off for him and uh, well, are the players who are the reason 
that he is so highly and vastly played. He's talking in reference to two uh, Oklahoma State players who have recently transferred over the... Well, one transferred last week, I think one transferred at the start of the season as well. Uh, but yeah, he's calling players who decide to go that route and don't fight for the battle for their jobs. Snowflakes. Uh, back in the duck days where Mike Gundy was a college player himself. He calls himself an Oklahoma State Cowboy for life, but he only become, went to Oklahoma State because he himself decommitted from Oklahoma back when he was a player. So Mike Gundy and college coaches in general are just the most, the most paranoid and weird bunch of high-paid people probably in, in any sport if you'd really uh, get down to it they can get he can get in the bin this week that's just just ridiculous things to say about teenage kids could not agree more uh, yeah well said yeah, anyone else for this week not anyone else in particular but something else which i think just uh i'm, I'm gonna have a quick quiz with you and see if you see if you can uh, get it right so aaron Rodgers could throw how many consecutive interceptions on how many is the same number straight pass attempts and still have a better career touchdown to interception ratio than Nathan Peter. <laughs> right. So Aaron, or Aaron Rodgers, when did he start? 2008? Yeah, something, something like that. Tenth season. Let's say he's got like 40 touchdowns a year. That's probably way too many. 30. Uh, 270. 1,240. <laughs> wow. That's so actually, that's in the bin, yeah. because it's an absolute outrage that there are quarterbacks who don't even need mentioning on this podcast <laughs> that are not allowed to play NFL and being backed out of a job, whilst idiots like Nathan Peterman, who are clearly I, not fit for I, purpose, I, 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 I have been getting jobs, and those jobs start in the NFL at their expense. So, um, so if Brett Hundley made a point uh, last week on Seahawks Twitter that if Brett Hundley goes elsewhere because uh, he's a free agent uh, in March, the Seahawks are in line for uh, a late round compensatory pick unless they sign some on a backup long snapper from the Lions. Um, there's a very good chance him just strikes me as a Pete Carroll quarterback. <laughs> um, so that's why I've kind of like I've got to add on, add on. <laughs> so, so fast forward to ten months time when he signs he's now Austin Davis for the 2019 Seahawks it's yeah oh god it just seems like it's going to happen but yeah the fact that Nathan Peterman has started as many games as he has this year let alone if anything is one reason that probably Sean McDermott should be on a fairly warm seat in the cold of northern New York in Buffalo um, lock and shot this week Adam not even got the schedule up my friend so i will let you start okay uh lock and shock my lock of the week is going to be the you haven't got the schedule up either i can tell no i have uh (laughs) lock of the week is going to be the panthers to beat the lions in detroit that offense is well the defense is going to bounce back which was a complete shit show in, in the first half of the Pittsburgh game. I think the, the Lions are... There, there seems to be... I mean, I, I think Jim Bob Cooter basically refused to ask, answer questions about Matt Stafford last uh, last night, I think it was, or earlier this week. It's, it could be an interesting situation developing that quarterback position in Detroit because it just doesn't seem to be pushing the team on as what we said with how Aaron Rodgers and our own Mr Wilson are doing. So, yeah, Panthers to bounce back and really nail down the 15th in the with a pretty hand win in Detroit, Adam. I will say the Chargers at home to the Broncos will demolish them. And I think Joey Bosa's back. He's definitely back practicing today. He's it? practicing, yeah. So that could be uh, a pretty nice addition to that team as they make... I mean, they're basically the Panthers, aren't they? They're going to pretty much nail on to be the 15th in the NFC, aren't they? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, uh, shall we, Adam? Um... I'm mulling over the Steelers at the Jaguars being a shock because they lost twice to the, to the Jaguars at home last year, but yeah. probably not enough. So I'm going to go with the, I think the Bears will beat the Vikings at home. Uh, now, obviously, that doesn't strike you necessarily as a shock because of the various positions, but going into the year, I can't imagine any analyst would have suggested that in week 11 of this season, the Vikings wouldn't be strong favourites against the Bears. So I think, uh, I think I'm going to go with that. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with... It doesn't really count as a shock. None of the other games really count as a shock, apart from 
that one. Um, I'm going to go with the... Uh, just because of who's hired this week, I think the Bengals are going to beat the Ravens in spite of everything that's going on in that offensive uh, room in Cincinnati. I think the Ravens are kind of... I think they're the only team in the NFL who have had a, a rushing play of over 20 yards so far through in this season, which is remarkable the way actually on that list. <laughs> Not on that list, but yeah, the Ravens are a bit of a weird offence. It just seems a matter of time before Lamar Jackson is the starting quarterback in Baltimore, doesn't it? Uh, well, he might be starting this, this week, I think, because Flacco's maybe not healthy. Oh, cool. That would be pretty cool because uh, they really do miss him in Louisville. Bobby Petrino was fired off what was possibly leave her most hopeless performance of college football. Yes, even despite Luskies in California a couple of weeks ago, the, the Louisville, oh my days, that's a team which have um, <laughs> John Gruden on their coach and he got fired, I think. There's a pretty cool, there's a pretty funny picture where he was the breaking news ticker was on Louisville local TV in Louisville with the current program being coach's room with Bobby Petrino, which is a pretty cool juxtaposition. Bobby Petrino has been fired and also talking about the, this team currently. Which, uh, yeah, and Bobby Petrino deserves everything he gets after what he did to the Falcons back in the day. Uh, one pretty weird thing on the 2018 NFL season is happening in Washington. Uh, every game that the Washington Redskins have won, they have they have led the game for every second of that. And every game the Redskins have lost this season, they have trailed every second of, and every minute in those games. They're the only team in the NFL who haven't had or suffered a lead change in any of their games this season, which is just bananas, isn't it, Adam? Yeah, that is completely crazy. Um Strange team, very strange team. Yeah, they kind of. I mean, Alex I mean, Smith kind of went back to his Utah days with a few uh, option players on Sunday, which was quite fun. Again, another team, even with a meh quarterback, can do fun things on offense. Adam, who the funk it? Impossible, can't be done. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, obviously, in old college football, we are going to try and do some drafting Seahawks. When I get round to editing things on the players, we want to focus on. But next week, Adam is the big one, the Apple Cup, and. For a change last few years, the Huskies are going to be playing spoiler for the Cougs are somehow only still the eighth ranked team in the nation after just demolishing Colorado this weekend. It's, I mean, they, they kind of should be higher, but it would be fun to kind of end all that fun, wouldn't it, next week? Yeah, I mean, the Pac-12 is not having its greatest year in terms of quality, so it doesn't stun me that uh, that's not being seen or given much respect. Um it would be good to go in, into Pullman and, and win, although I kind of sh- – I know I shouldn't, but I, it's hard not to have a bit of a soft spot for the Cougars this year after the horrific yeah. stuff with Hilinskin. We, we, made, we made a lot of good friends in October who are all diehard yeah. Cougar fans, and in a way, I'd quite to see them have, have you know, a good moment. But equally, I'm not, you know, as fanatical <laughs> a Husky fan as I am a no. Seahawks fan in, in any way, no. but uh, it would be quite nice to go and piss in their chips, let's be honest. <laughs> it would be. But at the same time, it would be quite cool to see them uh, – at least, at least getting the Rose Bowl. I don't think I don't think that top four is uh, is is I think it's out of their reach uh, with all what's going on uh, in the South the SEC. And as ever, that is somewhat of a bias. But yeah, I mean, uh, Minshew is just a great story. And obviously, another pretty cool visual from the weekend was when he put the, mus- the fake moustache on Mike Leach. Is that was great? Face. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So obviously that'll be next week. We are going to try and get one of those aforementioned Coug pals we made in October to jump on next week as we talk Seahawks and obviously then talk that game which is uh, in the early hours of Saturday morning next week. Yeah, the Seahawks are at home next this week against the Green Bay Packers later tonight. Then they've got the Panthers and but a game later on in the schedule when they face the 49ers at home has been flexed unsurprisingly out of um, Sunday Night Football. That was almost certain to happen the minute that uh, Jimmy Garoppolo's knee exploded on him uh, back in three or four, whatever it was. So the, that game is now a nine o'clock kickoff, one o'clock over in Seattle. Uh, and then, the, then two weeks after that, when they play again in uh, San Francisco at Levi's Stadium, the Scottish Seahawkers are having their fourth, I think. I think it's their fourth consecutive meet. If you haven't seen it, it's all on Facebook and Twitter. But if you want all the information, I can give you that now, no, I can't. It is at Van Winkle's Barbecue Pit in the centre of Glasgow, and it's on the 16th of December. If you want to get in touch with Gordon Wright or Gordon Curry, 
the graphic design done on Facebook or Twitter, you can. Scottish Hawks 12, I think, is Gordon's. Gordon Curry's uh, Twitter handle as well. If you want to get in touch with us on the podcast, you can at Facebook, The Pedestrian Podcast, on Twitter at, at Seahawkers UK, Instagram, Sea, uh, UK Seahawkers, on Facebook also is UK Seattle Seahawks fans' Facebook page. If you've got any requests or questions or any uh, bit ideas, and as I said, we do kind of want some ideas for the anti getting the bin because uh, we're still struggling for names. Uh, but yeah, we do encourage and welcome and appreciate any comments and feedback you give us on the podcast uh yeah if you yeah enjoy the game wherever you watch from whatever corner of the world you watch until next time this has been the pedestrian podcast go hawks a lot of guys hurt in your thursday night game obviously last year in arizona just the general idea of playing on sunday and then three days later Four days later, going back out there. What's your, what's your it's, thing it's on a that? challenge. It's a physical challenge for the guys. Um, emotionally, our guys handled it great. Um, I think uh, better than maybe we have in other years. And just in the whole conversation has been about the game and all that kind of stuff. Hasn't been about anything about the fact that it's uh, that there's a physical challenge to it. Our guys are not tuned into that end of it. So, but it is it is taxing. Um, the other side of it is, and there's always a good side to it. We get the big break on the weekend. And we'll take full advantage of that. <laughs>